Coming up this week on Sporting Journal Radio. The non-resident is not allowed to hunt in those areas, and so access is gone. Uh, It's just amazing what kind of things are coming out in the fishing industry. Did you see the story, David, about potential limits being put on mushroom hunters? I fish, I hunt, and always will. Broadcasting from the Alclair Outdoor Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. <clears throat> We're not just a radio show anymore. This is Sporting Journal Radio. That's right. Welcome to the show. My name is Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on the network by demand, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much. That's Dan Amundsen right over there. Dan, how you doing? Doing all right. David Eckhart sitting over there. He looks like he's going pheasant. It's huh? a radio show, David. You got to talk. <laughs> yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just nod. We're on the radio. But uh, we're also on YouTube, so maybe people saw you wave it, and nod my head. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> how you guys doing? Doing good. David, it's still doing good. How's your uh how are your crops looking over there? The field crops are looking good. The food plots they're coming along. They're behind, but they'll get there. We got a little bit of rain this week. It kinda yeah. helped. Not as much as we probably wanted though. Uh, we're right along. We've been getting some timely rains, so. Oh, so you think we're sitting pretty good then? I think For we're crops sitting anyway. okay, yeah. Okay. All right, well, we're going to talk about what effect the weather has had on uh, brood production for waterfowl. We'll dig into pheasants a little bit, too, but we got a couple of guys from Delta Waterfowl that are joining us on the show this week, Brad Heidel and Paul Waite. We're going to talk about the Duck Hunters Expo that's happening again this year in Arkansas and how similar it is to Pheasant Fest and why it's similar to Pheasant Fest. We'll find out why that is. And is it going to be in Arkansas all the time or is it going to come around to Minnesota? We'll find out. We'll talk about uh, access and non-resident changes for waterfowl hunters if you're going to travel somewhere. What is what is all this non-resident regulation changing? What kind of effect is that going to have? Is it going to keep changing what what exactly is going on we'll break it down with these guys coming up in just a little bit also it's iCast week so a lot of brand new fishing products being debuted down in Orlando and Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism is down there he's going to walk through the show for us talk about what he's seeing and if you're watching this he'll even show you what he's seeing on the floor at iCast this week but first Dan (laughs) who are the sponsors this week this week Live Target, match the hatch at LiveTargetLures.com this fishing season. Lake of the Woods Tourism, Lake of the Woods is the walleye capital of the world. Plan a trip for this summer at Lake of the Woods, MN.com. Haybell Heights, campground and resort. Book a trip to Devil's Lake. Learn more at HaybellHeights.com. Ottertail Lakes Country, find your inner otter at OttertailLakesCountry.com. And Prairie Sports when the new season is over, but you can watch episodes anytime at the Prairie Sports when YouTube channel or uh, watch reruns on you know, check your TV guide for local listings. Yeah, found yeah. out uh, our cousin Scott really likes the Haybell Heights read. He told me that this weekend. <laughs> oh, really? We don't know why. He just does. So, there you go, Scott. HaybellHeights.com. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we should plan a trip to. We should bring Scott up to Devil's Lake. He'd probably enjoy that. He would probably enjoy that a lot. We need to make a trip up there. Um, we just did a trip over to. Uh, well, we fished around the Wilmer area. And we were doing that because we were filming something for Casking. They needed a video for their booth at iCast. We had one day to film it. It was a little, we were a little nervous uh, about getting it all done. And we don't bass fish over there. David, you fish around Wilmer much. Have you bass fished over there much? I have never bass fished over there. Yeah. I don't really bass fish. Yeah. Well, we don't spend a lot of time doing it. We've been doing it more and more, mostly because we've had to film product stuff. Yeah. But, you know, bass fishing is fun. It's action. It's uh, casting. And so we were like, oh, there's, you know, there's a bunch of lakes around Wilmer. We'll let's just point at one. I, I looked up some DNR research on what lakes had largemouth and smallmouth. And we picked one of the ones that they said had higher numbers. And as we drove by it, we looked and we saw lily pads right by the axis. We're like, oh, yeah, this piece of cake. We're going to be done by noon. You know, we'll be laughing. How many hours did we spend over there, Dan? All day. <laughs> well, <laughs> not on that first lake. Oh, on that lake? Yeah, no. Uh, well, I don't know. What time did we leave? Uh, I was too angry to look at the clock. <laughs> Dan was so mad. There are uh, a lot of things going on. Yeah, we were, we were having some... Uh, 
some equipment issues here and there. And then we weren't catching fish. And then right away, like we filmed this intro for the, for the video. And then we're like, all right, we're going to run that shoreline right there. So we were kind of staging in front of it, getting gear ready to go. And all of a sudden, and there was nobody on the lake. I think there was one other boat on the lake that we didn't even see. And in the time that we launched and got set up to start fishing, a boat launched and just skirted right in front of us (laughs) and started fishing up the bank right in front of us. Like, are you kidding me? So we were Come yeah, on. in a bad mood right away and then didn't didn't catch any fish there. No. And if we can't catch a bass on a lake, uh, it's time to mm. go. Time to go. Time Wrap to go. her up. <laughs> so we leave and we drive over to one of the other lake and we clean off all the all the weeds. We pull the plug. We didn't have the anything in the live well, so we weren't keeping fish, whatever. And so we get to the next lake and there's an AIS inspector there. And let me just preface this by saying nobody wants to see more invasive species spread to other lakes. We always clean, drain and dry. We're, we're all about it. But we get there and this person will not let us launch the boat. Like, nope, nope. You need uh, you need to fill out this paperwork saying you're transporting prohibitive invasive species and you need to go. Well, you either need to go home and let it dry for five days. You need to go to the the, the uh, decontamination station at Green Lake, or you need to go to a car wash. And I, immediately, my that was a red flag for me. Like, we, we're required to go do this now, but we can go through a car wash? Like, who's going to watch us go through the car wash and make sure we do it? Like, I was completely mind-boggled at this point. And then we get to... We get to the decontamination station and th- and these people there running it were very nice people, but they kept telling us it was the law for us to do this, that we had to go from one lake to another lake and that it was the law. And we're sitting there in the car trying to figure out when did it become a law? Yeah, but, where is it written down? Yeah, will you move just a little bit closer to that mic, David? Um, or move the mic up closer. It's, it's the law to clean, drain, and dry, dispose of your bait. Drain your live wells, pull your plug, but it's not the law to rest your boat for five days and let it dry or go through decontamination station. Even if you come from an infested lake, it's not, it's just a recommended. Will it become law? Probably. And while, okay, so let's preface this too and say it became law that we had to do it when the AIS inspector told us to go do that. They have that discretion to do that. So that's where it becomes law. If she was not there, it would not have been law for us to go do that. It's, it all becomes on their discretion. And so I'm guessing that's a county policy. But there was, you know, every time I try to clarify it, there was no, nobody could show us any legislation on here's where it's cut and dry or here's why it's the law for you to now do this. Or, you know, I asked the question, what if I'm in a county that doesn't have one of these stations or what do I do? And was still told that we still had to clean our boat and do this, blah, blah, blah. Well, no, we don't. I mean, yes, it's, it's recommended. It's strongly recommended to do it, right? Because, yeah. we again, none of us want to see invasive species spread. But, Correct. I mean, at some point, we got to be realistic about it. I mean, look at the boundary waters. Are we spraying off our canoes every time we portage? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> let's let's think about it yeah. from a realistic standpoint here, people, and and. I get it. We want to do everything we can, but yeah, you know, I, I kind of started to relate it. Not that I want to get into this politics of anything, but it's like trying to stop COVID or a disease. Yeah. Well, it's not, you know, whoa, this, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know, I know. Whoa. I don't really want to. I don't really want to go down We're that get road. Banned but, on YouTube now for yeah, saying sorry. that. Sorry, but you know, you guys know what I'm trying to say. Right. Like, yeah, at some point, you just. There's nothing you can do about it, and we're going way over the top to to try to do something that's not going to make any sense, especially when we're coming from a place that didn't have any in, invasive well, species. And that, and and again, my main issue with this whole situation is not the clean draining and drying, obviously, not even going through the decontamination station. It's the messaging, and if 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 their policy, maybe their policy in that county is just to tell that person that has the discretion to make it a law to require you. Maybe they just tell her, hey, every boat you see, make them sign that paperwork and do it. Like we're just going to force these people to do Probably. it. Probably. I don't necessarily agree with that method, but then I'd get it. And then the other people were saying the whole time it was the law. So either either they were lying to us or they were told the wrong thing. Or that's their policy in that county is to make it their law and their discretion to make people go do this. But yeah, I don't know. Who knows? It, There's it also just, a ton of AIS in that county. Well, yeah, and that's <laughs> probably, probably more honestly, than I see in every other 
county. And that's so. probably why they're trying to step yeah. up efforts. Sure. So I'll give people credit for, for doing it. And if, and if some of those people are volunteers out there, I give them credit for doing it. We don't want to see more invasive species, but man, we were under a lot of pressure and kind of under the clock and things were going wrong for us at the start. And then we ran into this that sidelined us for, I don't know, an About hour, an hour yeah. two hours. That had to go, you know, burning gas going out of our way again. I'm not trying I yeah. want to make it clear we're not against the yes. idea of cleaning our boats and I know, it makes it sound like per- we're complaining about I know. It. We're not. It's it's a we're trying to we're nice, trying to keep it nice realistic. to know beforehand. So yeah, yeah, nice to know beforehand or at least have a cut and dry here's why that's it. Here's yes. Here's right. this instead of a whole bunch of confusion on are we I mean this, this I, I felt like we were just wasting time. It was we, the came, we came from a lake without any in, invasive species. We didn't have any weeds or anything on our trailer so I mean, what, are, what are we doing at this point here? It is the messaging and the situation and then what effect that's going to have on tourism and, and boating and, and people that want to fish. I mean, you go to an area like that because it's got multiple lakes to fish. I mean, if, you, if you're if you going to have to take your boat off one lake and rest it for five days before you can go somewhere to, to, to a different lake, you know, or or drive over to Green Lake to the decontamination station every time you want to change lakes, it's I don't know what the right answer is. And I'm not trying to complain too much about it because ultimately we want to see these efforts be successful. So anyway, it was it was an interesting experience, but it was a successful one in the end. We had a great, great day of fishing overall, and we've got a video. If you're at ICAST, you can watch the video <laughs> right now in the booth. Otherwise, you'll see it coming to the Fish Hunt Forever YouTube channel, and uh, you should subscribe to it. And while you're online, check out the Fish Hunt Forever store. we got new hats new hats that are coming to the store and some new sun shirts and a bunch of other hoodies and mugs and things like that. And during the month of July, when you buy something from our store, we'll donate 15% of all sales to Minfish, who is providing advocacy work, much needed advocacy work toward fishing opportunities in Minnesota. Another interesting thing coming to Minnesota, guys, we, we're running out of time here. We got to got to get to our guests but real quick did you see the story david about potential limits being put on mushroom hunters i haven't seen it yet no so there's a story out you can see it on the outdoorfeed.org is where we saw it the outdoorfeed.org uh limits may be placed on foragers in minnesota and i've spoken to i spoke that was my first reaction i've spoken to a number of people that are heavy into foraging in minnesota and mushroom hunters and so forth and they have mixed feelings about it and right now it's it's mostly uh, about state parks and, you know, some sort of state land because uh, some people are. I, one story was shared with me that somebody went in and just got buckets and buckets and buckets of, I think it was morels or something. And then we're trying to sell them to all the other people that normally go there and forage for 50 bucks a bucket or whatever the price was. I don't know. So there's definitely some situations where I could see some limits being good, but at the, but you know, on the, at the, the face of it, it's like, wait a minute, you're going to limit how many morels I can go pick half the time. I can't even find them, <laughs> you know? So, uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a couple of bigger names in the Minnesota foraging world to discuss this controversial topic. First though, this week we've got Paul White and Brad Heidel coming up from Delta waterfall. And also Joe Henry, who has an ICAST walkthrough coming up on sporting journal radio. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. Devil's Lake is legendary, and this summer has been legendary for walleyes. Don't miss out. Call Haybell Heights Campground and Resort today to book one of their modern cabins on East Bay. The cabins are furnished with a full bathroom, kitchen, and all the amenities like high-speed internet and are clean following CDC guidelines. Staying at Haybell Heights gives you full access to a private boat launch, fish cleaning station, and beach area. Learn more at haybellheights.com. That's haybellheights.com. Plan your trip to legendary Devil's Lake today. Hi, this is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen along with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart. And we didn't make it to ICAST this year, but that doesn't mean we're not going to bring you some ICAST content because Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism is down there right now on the floor. Joe, how's it going? Hey, guys, how you doing? Welcome uh, welcome to uh, sunny, not cool, 
Orlando, Florida. It's cool, but <laughs> it's not cool. You? It's cool in the building, put it that way. Oh, man. I remember last year we had to be there the couple of days before for setup, too, when we were down there with Live Target, and they didn't have, they had just kicked on the air conditioning in that big building, and it was 100 degrees outside, and it was like 110 inside that building. Yeah. Oh, it, 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 what you, the, the air is working just fine today, and it's hot. It's hot and humid outside. It's, it's central Florida, but uh, I'll tell you what, you know, you, you get to the parking lot, it's probably like Minnesota in the winter when it's super cold. Same thing, you know, we uh, we kind of scurry uh, through the elements and get inside where it's nice and warm, and I think that's what you do in Florida. But, you know, guys, uh, and, and I know you guys know this, but ICAST is the largest fishing show in North America, and it features, you know, freshwater, saltwater, fly fishing. It's kind of the who's who in the fishing industry. Companies are releasing new products, and uh, there's the pros I hear. I had a chance to talk with Kevin Van Dam today, Steve Panaz. Uh, I can go on and on with a list of who's who, but, you know, uh, with, with Lake of the Woods tourism, you know, we're a fishing destination, and it's amazing how by just being present down here and the companies you meet that might want to come up and do a film shoot or some of the pros that want to come up and shoot a TV show or, you know, you run into different TV networks and different media, and, you know, it's something good always happens, and that's why that's why I attend ICAST every year. Yeah, it, it was a really neat event last year, and obviously we saw a lot of really cool products, but the, the biggest thing was being able to just – see people and meet them and then afterwards hang out with them and have a have a beverage or have some have some food and get get uh, do some of that networking get get some of the real work done down there joe exactly well the relationships are huge you know i uh yeah there's a minnesota company called of course blackfish that's part of clam, clam outdoors and you can see the booth here they're releasing their new stuff and you know just every year there's more technology there's things to see i mean uh it's uh really quite interesting down here and uh boy i tell you you know uh we we had the new product uh uh releases last night we had a chance to see and boy i tell you between the lures the plastics the digital the i mean uh it's just amazing what kind of things are coming out in the fishing industry and uh it's also interesting you know seeing different aspects you know the the salt water aspects of this i mean salt water is obviously huge and um, some of the different products that come out for that aren't applicable to, to freshwater, like up at Lake of the Woods. But um, it's it's still very interesting to see what technology has done and and really how companies are trying to leverage new products to to increase sales. I sometimes yeah. wonder what part of that is actually true better fishing and better fishing products, and what part of that is to target the, the actual fisher, the, the, the angler, I guess. I want to ask you what I'm sure you've been through the new product showcase. I want to ask you what new products you've seen out there that you, that have caught your eye. But while you're walking around, Joe, look for the Cast King booth because you might see uh, Dan or I on the TV there, uh, or at the live Target booth too. You might see us uh, at the live Target booth. <laughs> Hi, <Yeah>. ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I did walk by the Cast King booth, and I next time I'll have to actually take a closer look. But uh, yeah, you asked about new products, and you know, Rappel is coming out with a line of plastics and. Uh, Boy, I thought that was, uh, you know, really neat. Um, what else? You know, there's, uh, I noticed that uh, Clam, uh, Clam Outdoors came out with some new ice fishing setups. They also came out with a new, uh, a new bait that's kind of a, it's kind of a, a search bait, almost like a jig and wrap that's uh, about an inch long and uh, is very, very small, but uh, that's going to be for targeting panfish. I noticed that there were some jigs that weren't round, but rather they were, a, a weird a different shape that's supposed to get detected by forward-facing sonar better so many people are using forward-facing sonar and they want to be able to see where their lure is in proximity to the fish or the structure that they're targeting so they're making new shapes and new materials that can get seen by sonar a little bit better and uh, you know all those things are, it's just very interesting in the fishing industry things are changing they're always changing right and um it's you know icast is where everything gets revealed yeah. And, you know, we're kind of listening to you, Joe, but Dan and I are both squinting into the screen right now to see who we recognize and what products are on display there. Yeah, no, it just, you know, everywhere you go, there's a lot of really, really neat, uh, neat products. And, uh, um, you know, and, and, and some of the booths are bigger, you know, you get some small tackle companies that are trying to make a, uh, make an impression. And then you got companies like, oh, you look at Shimano booth. I mean, can you imagine what this booth cost? And look at the, <laughs> the time and effort that goes into something like this. Yeah. So you really, uh, you really got a little bit of everything, and uh, um, it's 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 good. But uh, but that and you know all this. I mean, you know, and, and let's face it, a lot of these products that are introduced here will end up being used up at Lake of the Woods, and uh, 
you know, uh, it's going to be fun to see these things roll out. Uh, I talked to Tom Boley earlier. You probably know uh, his name. He does uh, some really good fishing videos. He was with Acme Tackle Company, and he talked about fishing Lake of the Woods and how, you know, even himself, how the way he used to fish Lake of the Woods is changing with the forward-facing sonar and how, uh, you know, instead of pulling spinners or pulling cranks over the basin now, he's going and sharpshooting walleyes, finding mm -hmm. them in the deep mud, and then he's pitching oh, kind of a – it's almost like a uh, a lead head with a spinner on it and a single Aberdeen hook that really shows up well on the forward-facing sonar. And, uh, yeah, just, again, the way people are fishing because of technology is really changing. And uh, it's it's, it's going to be fun to see how that uh, plays out on Lake of the Woods. I can tell you that we just had the Minnesota Tournament Trail up on Lake of the Woods. And I didn't hear details on how the guys caught them, but I can tell you, uh, the guys and gals, I should say, a lot of couples and a lot of ladies fishing it too. But I can tell you that I'm speaking to some of the anglers just before the tournament. They were talking about how they've changed their fishing style and how they're sharp shooting walleyes on Lake of the Woods, whether it's on structure, going on rock piles, looking for bigger fish, or maybe it's uh, going out in no man's land in that deep mud where those big fish live and actually looking for a big fish and then targeting that big fish casting to them with different baits and uh well, that's really different i can tell you this that you know those those uh, anglers for the minnesota tournament trail who were up there last week they averaged about a about a gosh if i were to say it was about a uh it wasn't a six pound average and uh wow uh, it, it was they, they caught a lot of big fish and uh, uh danny maybe you can pull that up and give me yeah. uh back me up a little bit but it was they caught a lot of big fish in that tournament and that happens every year you got us definitely distracted. If you're watching this right now, we're watching Joe walk through iCast, and uh, it's definitely taking up a lot of our attention right now. If you're listening to this, well, you need to turn this on YouTube and, and check it out. Anything new, Joe, that you're going to add to your tackle box? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, probably eventually. You know, I think uh, I tell you, some of those plastics I saw from Rapala kind of neat. They had some new crankbaits out. You know, some of the clam uh, ice fishing stuff I thought was kind of neat. Um <laughs> and then just even some of the hooks are coming out with, with new materials. Yeah, there's stuff. And, uh, you know, I don't know when I'll get my hands on some of this stuff, but it's it's coming, no doubt. Um, you know, I think the other thing that's interesting is, uh, like, kayaks. You know, we, we had hosted a Hobie event up at Lake of the Woods at one point in time. And, you know, the, the kayak industry is really coming on strong. And the electronics and the rod holders, the different kind of kayaks they're making, um, and, you know, there's people that fish the Rainy River. There's people that fish up on the islands with those kayaks. I know people that go and target those early season pike on Zippo Bay and Four Mile Bay. You know, just there's different niches to the fishing industry that play well on Lake of the Woods. Not all of them have played out so far. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot more to come, but, uh, but, it, but it's certainly coming. It's amazing how using forward-facing sonar is changing the way people fish, not just on – maybe maybe scouting and, and hunting for big fish and then stopping and casting and you know pitching at them or whatever but deciding what size bait to use so you have something that not only will trigger a strike but also show up well on that on that forward facing sonar like that's there i don't know how many times i'm pitching jigs i'm like man i can't see my jig that's that's <laughs> half the reason i use a tungsten jig these days because tungsten shows up on sonar better than than lead yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, I, I fished, I happened to fish the uh, the ICAST Cup, which is kind of a, it's kind of a media event. And, uh, you know, um, the, the pro and, and uh, the company representative I was fishing with, they had forward-facing sonar, Hummingbird, on their on their boats, and uh, or on their boat, I should say. And both of those guys were up in front, and they were casting to different brush piles. Sometimes they could see the fish, sometimes they couldn't. And then I was just casting in the back of the boat, no man's land, you know, trying to pick up fast. But... You know, we, uh, they, they, they were casting specifically, and it, he said, even in the bass industry, absolutely has changed, you know, the, how, how fishing is uh, is happening. Um, you can see uh, which booth I'm at right now. I'm at the, happened to stroll by the Humminbird booth, and um, I'll tell you what, Minn Kota came out with a really big uh, trolling motor, real high-powered trolling motor. I think it's called the Riptide, but uh, this motor is a freaking beast, and uh, uh, this one's big. I can tell you that uh, in addition to that one, I think Garmin has come out with a new trolling motor the that actually in. has um, the live scope within the shaft. So all the wiring and everything is within that shaft. Um, I think I think it was PowerPole came out with a new trolling motor that's actually a titanium shaft. It's real small head on top. But again, 
all changes, all, all advancements in the fishing industry. It's amazing. And it's amazing that you get to see all those products in one place. You know, last year was our first trip to ICAST and it was, uh, it's, it's really an eye opener when it comes to the who's who in the fishing world, the brands and, uh, and all the new products. What is that right there, Joe? Yeah, this is a, uh, this is fly fishing over here and uh, you get the opportunity to, to cast a fly rod, some of the new products. And, uh, you see his, he's whipping it out there and, and just check it out. Look at the water I and mean, look what they got set up for that. Yeah, that wasn't there last year. Are there any trout swimming around in there? Nope, nope. R- oh. Rural, uh, I, I'd say that water is probably an inch or two deep, probably a little yeah. bit too shallow for uh, for holding fish right now. But uh, I'll tell you what, if there's a trout pond, I'd be fishing it. Man, I'll tell you, that'd be fun. <laughs> it's like when you go to a sports show, right? How did, uh, how was that ICAST Cup? How was fishing, Joe? Fishing, fishing was a little bit tough. Um, we, we did end up with, uh, it was, you would weigh three bass and the three bass we weighed were nine and a half pounds total. So we had about a three, a little over a three pound average. The winning bag was uh, over 18 pounds. So a six pound average. And I think the big fish was just under nine pounds. It was about eight Jeez. and a half pounds. Wow. So some nice fish were caught. And uh, you know, it was, it's amazing in Florida and central Florida, how, you know, you can be, uh, we, it, the tournament was just as a meal. The, the tournament was a uh, four-hour tournament from 6.30 in the morning till 10.30 in the morning. And uh, I tell you, it's unbelievable how hot it can get in Central Florida at oh, 10.30 yeah. in the morning. <laughs> Just no, crazy hot. Well, very good. Uh, it's interesting. We're missing, definitely missing ICAST this year. We'll have to try to get back down there again next year. But, um, you know, we would also take a trip to Lake of the Woods instead, too. I'd- <laughs> <laughs> either, either well, and you know, I, uh, you, I know you guys will get back down here, and uh, I'll tell you what, we're walking up to uh, another, but it's kind of funny, you know, you walk from fly fishing, and of course you walk over to climb, and you got the fish houses set up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I walked by, um, <laughs> you know, most people are saying, oh, that's kind of neat, a tent for my kids camping. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I saw. I don't, I don't know if you know it, what this really is. I don't know that heat. Danny Thompson or somebody shared a picture on Instagram when he got there, and it was an ice castle parked up. Aquaview park. had it, I think. Oh, it was Aquaview. Yeah, that's Aquaview what it was. brought trailered one down there. How many? How yeah, many well, people that, in yeah, Florida? Yeah, I saw Colt Ringer earlier, and uh, yeah, Colt, Colt said, "Hey, how do you how do you like uh, how do you like our our, uh, our prop we have here this year?" And uh, it was a wheelhouse. Yeah, and I guarantee you, most people most people in Central Florida haven't seen a wheelhouse, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Oh, They're hey, like, why does this camper here too? Look at that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, why does but, this uh, camper drop down to the ground? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> why, why would a camper have floors on the oh, holes in the holes floor? In the right? Right. Yeah. Is that the PM? Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it is. When you're camping, but don't right. come over here. And of course, you know, there's always there's always new uh, new lures happening. So if I slide over here, check this display out. They got a whole line of uh, all terrain tackle. It's bass fishing oh. tackle. Oh, that's cool. Hey, I don't even see some of that stuff. Or, uh, we, Steve Hoggy, we knew real well growing up who started that company. So that's, uh, it's very cool to see that down there. He's probably running around there, uh, too, yeah, right maybe. now, I bet. All right, Joe, we'll let you get back to the show, but, uh, appreciate the, okay. the check in and, and walking around for us. Say hi to everybody down there for us. And, and, uh, if people want to plan a trip to Lake of the Woods, what should they do? Well, I tell you what, uh, Fisher Biden, check out our website, and that is Lake of the Woods, MN.com. Northern Minnesota's Walleye Factory is a year-round world-class fishing destination. The perfect getaway this summer is just a short drive to Lake of the Woods. Fish Big Traverse Bay, the Rainy River, or visit the unique Northwest Angle. To catch big fish, you have to go where the big fish are. Plan your trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. That's lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Kodiak, a North American waterfowl film, is coming to the Fish Hunt Forever YouTube channel. Well, I've been a sea duck hunter for about 30 seconds, and I've already got one that's probably going to go on the wall, so this is the coolest duck hunt I've ever been on. Presented by Boss Shot Shells, with support from Sitka and Beretta, and additional support from Alclair Outdoors, High Prairie Animal Arts, and the Association of Great Lakes Outdoor Riders. Watch Kodiak on the Fish Hunt Forever YouTube channel.
Hi, this is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen, along with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart. Thanks for tuning in on the network by demand, sportingjournalradio.com. Or maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much. You should be watching it if you're a waterfowl guy, because we'll probably have some uh, some eye candy uh, coming for you during this segment right now as we talk about ducks and geese. And uh, big old Duck Hunters Expo. It's coming up in uh, Arkansas here in uh, just a couple of weeks. So we've got a couple of guys from Delta Waterfowl to join us on the show right now. Uh, Brad Heidel and Paul Waite are going to jump jump on with us how you doing gentlemen great thank you Very it's, good. it's never too early to start talking about the duck hunting season in my opinion i mean i like i like to fish and we got some cool things coming up yet this summer but i am literally every year counting down the days until uh until fall gets here and hunting season gets here and i'm excited about it you guys are in wisconsin correct what are what are conditions like in wisconsin what do you what do you think the season's going to look like this year Paul, go ahead. You start out. Yeah, so uh, we started out with a lot of water in northeast Wisconsin, and it has dried out considerably. Um, I think we're going to have a good hatch. I'm not a biologist, but, you know, we started out with with good duck numbers, certainly looking at uh, the state DNRs surveys, too. Um, you know, the numbers look pretty good. I just hope that, um, you know, we get some rain because we really need it. It's really been super dry since about middle of May. Um, but but I'm optimistic, and I'll tell you, you know, a lot of our ducks come from the prairies, and the eastern part of the prairies looks pretty good. I was just up in Saskatchewan two weeks ago, and it looked pretty good there, lots of ducks. Oh, good. So, and uh, the Dakotas are certainly pretty good, too. That's good, because I remember I go to Saskatchewan every year, and I was up there... I'm trying to remember what year it was, 2021, I think. And I was flying over the southern part of Saskatchewan and every slough was dry. Like every single one that we flew over was bone dry. So I, I got a little nervous that year, but uh, obviously a lot of duck production up there. So that's good to hear that there's some water. Yeah. yeah. I, can, I can tell you that that map you just brought up where there's that nasty orange spot in Wisconsin, that is right where I am at. Man. Uh, no. We, we haven't seen rain here since uh, I would say probably the first week in May. And uh, as we're speaking here today, it's actually, we're getting our first rain in that amount of time. It's, it's dry. It's dry. Brad with a uh, pheasants forever background and the effect that, you know, those storms in, in June and er, late May and early June, what's what effect heavy storms and hail can have on pheasant nest nesting mm -hmm. success. Uh, how much is that? I'm assuming it's got to be fairly similar for duck nests as well, too, especially those ducks that are nesting in the grass like a pheasant would. It's good. It's going to be similar. Um, but uh, I don't I think uh, and I'm not knocking the pheasant, but I think uh, a duck is a little bit tougher bird. Yeah. Uh, just simply because of, of their structure and, and how they live and where they live and uh, they're accustomed to water. And, and I just think they're a little tougher bird. And I would say that uh, they'll probably do, they'll fare a little bit better than a pheasant. Yeah. And I, you know, you, you see mallard nests at times in people's yards or uh, up, you know, next to their garage or, or whatever. But I had a blue winged teal nest in my yard. Was that, la was that two last year? Ago. Two years ago. And uh, I found it because I was kind of walking through the grass and I flushed the, the hen up off the nest. And I was like, oh, oh okay. So I went, I, I actually put up a GoPro right next to the nest. And I had it for two days. I was able to film her on her nest a little bit. It was pretty interesting. I came back the third day and the nest was completely trashed. And I had raccoons all over my trail cameras. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, we went on, uh, kind of went, tried to uh, knock out a few raccoons after that. It was a little bit of a... And we didn't. No, we tried to. <laughs> and we, did. we, we tried to. Hey, I, I think that's a perfect segue for Paul to talk a little bit more about Delta Waterfowl and, and what we do is as an organization to put more ducks over decoys. I agree. Yeah. So one of Delta's four pillars as the duck hunters organization is uh, duck production. And our two primary uh, duck production tools are predator management and hen houses. And both of those tools are designed to uh, keep the hen, the nesting hen, uh, out of harm's way as much as possible in the wild. So get that duck, um, you know, a better chance to, to uh, hatch a nest um, because predation certainly is a, a huge problem 
um, in in many parts of the prairie. Uh, so, yeah, so you're you're showing hen houses there. Um, that's one of our key programs. We have twelve thousand hen houses in the prairie pothole region, wow. and they're very effective at uh, producing mallards. It, it just gets those that nesting hen up over the water, out of the grass, and away from predators that can can uh, get at it. And, and predators, I mean, weather is probably your number one determining factor on, on nest success or, or population, but predators are something we can actually control, right? Or at least try to control. I mean, that's gotta, that's gotta have a big impact on, uh, on nest success and population goals out there. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, it, it gives the nesting hen a chance to hatch a nest. I mean, it, in areas where there's not as much grass cover, uh, because the land is developed and and use for farming and other uses um you know all the ducks go in the high grass that are around these wetlands and guess where all the predators go to they all go in that grass and so um you know it it becomes easy for the predators to find those nesting ducks uh, much easier and so the a much higher percentage of the nests fail then because of predation so predator management and hen houses give those ducks a chance, kind of balances out the playing field a little bit and allows a lot more nests to hatch. And of course, that means more ducks. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the great things that's come out of the, those predation programs that you do at Delta Waterfowl is that obviously coyotes are an issue when it comes to predation on a lot of things, pheasants, ducks, uh, whatever. But it also you, you also highlighted the fact that some of these other uh animals like raccoons and skunks can be uh, as big of a problem or even bigger when it comes to uh, raiding nests and nest predation. Yeah. And yeah, they're, they're, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Paul. I'm, or I'll, I'll just go ahead. Actually, um, the coyotes don't have a dramatic effect on, on waterfowl and, and probably not such a dramatic effect on pheasants either. It's really those smaller predators like the raccoons, the possums, ravens, and skunks uh, that are really doing the damage out on the prairies to these nesting birds. Yeah, I think that's, I think that was something that a lot of people, I mean, obviously some people knew that, but I think a lot of people were surprised when they started to learn that coyotes don't have as big of an, it doesn't mean I'm not going to try, <laughs> try to eliminate all the coyotes Fair around enough. me, but <laughs> coyotes between you and me. Too busy chasing fawns. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's that too. But, um, but that's, that's interesting. How, like how many years, when did Delta, Paul, when did Delta Waterfall start to focus on predators? How, how long has that been going on? Yeah, so the first predator management studies were done in North Dakota in 1994. So mm-hmm. we've been at this about 30 years. Um, we've studied it in a lot of different places in the Prairie Pothole region. Um, and we implemented it as a program about five years ago where we're actually doing it not as uh, research, um, anymore, but as an actual program to aid duck production. So we've been at the predator management, we've studied it, we've refined it, we're, we continue to do that. Um, and, and, and it's quite effective um, in, in many areas of the prairie, especially in the areas where there's a lot of crop fields where it's working land for agricultural production. Because in those areas, there's, there's less grass less nesting cover uh for those ducks to use and so it uh it becomes more effective mm-hmm. we can have a greater impact in those areas yeah. obviously yeah it actually, oh, go ahead, sorry, right? it actually becomes very effective and uh you know we ju- we are just implementing a new campaign here at delta waterfall called our million duck campaign where it's going to actually allow us to put a million additional ducks into the fall flight on a yearly basis into perpetuity with what with roughly 250,000 of those ducks coming from our hen house structures structures and roughly uh, 750,000 of those coming through our predator management program and a lot of people will say well well how can you do predator management on a large scale basis it, it just doesn't work well it, it actually after 30 years of research we have determined yes it does work and it works extremely effectively and it's a very efficient tool to put more ducks over decoys is as well um, and what we do is we find the areas with the 
densest populations of nesting birds and concentrate on those areas. We call them trapping hotspots. And then we concentrate on those areas where the most uh, hens are nesting and we eliminate as many of the predators as we possibly can from that particular area. It's all fascinating stuff. You know, we love to hunt and I think it's good that people that love to hunt also know the amount of work that goes into creating, uh, you know, stable duck populations for us and sound management and, and habitat work and everything. So we can continue to have successful hunting seasons and, and promote. And I want to talk about some of the education side of things. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a pretty interesting stat I saw on the website about how up to 70% of wildlife management students have little to no experience hunting when that, that just blows my brain. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. We got to take a quick break uh we're with brad heidel and paul wade from delta waterfall more coming up on sporting journal radio live target the leader and match the hatch is back with new lures that also match the action introducing the live craw the live craw is irresistible to bass walleye and other freshwater species f winner the ultimate frog looks and acts just like a swimming frog with an exposed ultra point mustad hook and replaceable legs the ultimate frog has two styles two sizes and eight colors and i cast an f winner the live shrimp mimics a fleeing shrimp for saltwater anglers coming soon from live target did you know there are more than 1,000 lakes in ottertail county yep and i'm gonna fish as many as i can i'm an outdoorsy otter nothing beats a full day of fishing for me the lakes of ottertail county give me plenty of options to lower my boat and snag the perfect catch not an outdoorsy otter no problem ottertail county has something for everyone you just need to find your inner otter. To find your inner otter, go to ottertaillakescountry.com. We're back. This is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen along with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart. Thanks for tuning in on this station on the radio network. Also by downloading the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts or maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much. Make sure to give us a like and subscribe if you like what you're hearing. Share this with your friends. We appreciate it. We're talking ducks and waterfowl right now with Brad Heidel and Paul Waite from Delta Waterfowl. And I was I was on your website and I read a pretty interesting stat and it was that up to 70% of wildlife management students have little to no experience hunting. And you guys at Delta Waterfall are doing something about it. I don't know which one of you guys wants to answer this question, but uh, it, it, it's good. We need to have wildlife managers out there. It's good to see people interested in it that don't have a hunting background, but they have to understand the hunter's perspective, don't they? They do. And um, Paul, if you don't mind, I'll handle this one because it is one of my favorite uh favorite projects that we do here at Delta Waterfowl. We started out about three, maybe four years ago, um, understanding first that there's a need, because like you said, roughly 70% of these people that are going into these wildlife professions don't hunt. And uh, when I was growing up, I'm 56 years old, when I was growing up, everybody that went into wildlife, whether they're a conservation officer, whether they're a fish biologist, a wildlife ecologist, et cetera, all of these people hunted and so they got it they understood it and now we have people moving into these positions who don't understand a where their paychecks coming from yeah. and b also they don't understand the, the why we cherish this and why we love it so much and and they're making decisions that directly affect us so four years ago we started this program roughly and we were in nine large universities uh, here in the United States. Last year, we tackled 75 different universities with this program. And we take these students through the entire process. We take them through, I sound like Canadian there. <laughs> yes, uh, you did. We, process. So, like, Dr. <laughs> uh, so uh, we take them through that process. And what we do is um, we uh, take them through their hunter safety program. We take them to the range. We teach them how to shoot a shotgun. We take them out on their first hunt. We show them how to clean the game. We show them how to cook the game and eat it. And and some, I would say most, actually enjoy the experience and become hunters moving forward. But even if they don't, they have a better understanding of why we love it so much. And hopefully when they're making decisions about hunting and hunters and and all the things that we do in the future, um, they'll think about it a little bit more. Um, I can tell you a really cool story. Um, we took six gals out from the University of Colorado uh, probably about two years ago, I think. 
and these gals hadn't hunted before and they got into an absolutely cosmic snow goose hunt uh one day and uh That's awesome. stuff that we just dream about from time to time and two of the gals who hunted were vegans <laughs> and both those gals killed the birds both of those gals cleaned birds and both those gals ate birds whoa and they have since become hunters and taking white tail taking pheasants taking more waterfowl and you know like I, for me i just don't quite understand it but they were vegans not because they didn't enjoy meat they did not like not knowing where their meat came from mm. and now they have a source to actually go out and, and get the meat that they do love and know exactly where it came from but they also understand what what hunting is all about and why we love it so much yeah, I think I think that has really come out in the last well last five to ten years. Just how hunting is kind of the natural, the it's natural and organic, right? Like, mm -hmm. like uh, all these people that want to be eat healthy and things like that. They didn't they didn't re they don't they didn't ever equate it hunting with eating healthy and living a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. I think it's starting. We to just happen. need to, and we also need to get our families to better understand that we are supplying with them with some of the most expensive meat on the face of the earth. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, have you looked at the price of shells? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh man, it's so much fun. I enjoy it. You know, Dan and I, we, we, our freezer is starting to get a little, uh, it's starting to empty out finally, but, um, we've been eating a lot of, we've been getting into, we were saving the venison, but during the, the waterfall season, I mean, you shoot nowadays, you can shoot so many Canada geese. We, we end up eating Canada goose just about every day, pretty much got the crock pot rolling every day and, uh, just, throwing new breasts in there and slow cooking it, making sandwiches and tacos and, and eating it every day. It's uh, it's really delicious. And for people that don't think yeah. a Canada goose is good to eat, you're just not doing it right. In my, I, I in got my excited. If you guys, day, uh... I was digging well, through the freezer and I found a, I found one more bag of goose legs. Oh, all like, the best. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I got to fire up the crock pot and get them going. That's so hey, good. Have you guys made any pastrami out of your goose yet? I haven't done pastrami. Yet. I've had it. It's yeah. good. I have I've a buddy it. that made it. And right. It's like it's really not that hard. Yeah, I'll send you guys a recipe, and, and it, it literally is. It's it's a two week brine on goose breasts, and when, when they come out of that brine, it's fully cooked. It's it, you don't have to do anything else with it, and it's absolutely spectacular. Hey, I want to talk about Canada again real quick, and we don't have to get into this topic. But uh, first of all, you guys both been to Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and when you talk about talking and speaking like a canadian have you noticed do they call hoodies bunny hugs in manitoba or is that just a saskatchewan thing you guys know what i'm talking about <laughs> i've never I've, heard them called bunny hugs before paul you, you have you heard that I've in saskatchewan heard that. i've heard that yeah, yeah. I, I don't know where that originated from or if that's just a Saskatchewan thing, but uh, I think yeah. it is all, all my buddies up in Saskatchewan. They say that, that it's, it's purely a Saskatchewan thing. And that's the first time I was up there like, Hey, nice bunny hug. I'm like, what, what did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? Um, what? Yeah. But, uh, Manitoba changed their regs for non-residents this year. Um, you're seeing it, you know, when it comes to like turkeys and deer hunting, like uh, South Dakota, Nebraska have all changed things. Now, Kansas is going to change some things for non-resident guys. I, between you and me, I think Saskatchewan is probably going to change things too eventually. What do you guys think about some of these changes for non-resident hunters that like to travel around to hunt waterfall? Uh, I think that it's really interesting. I'm working on a big story for Delta Waterfall Magazine about access right now. Mm -hmm. And I did speak to Tom Bedrowski of Kansas uh, Game and Parks um, this week. And, oh, really? Yeah, about the regulation changes uh, that they're proposing. And those won't take effect this year. Uh, at earliest, it would be next year. Um, you know, they're, they're seeing an influx of of non-resident hunters and the it's affecting the quality of the resident hunter experience and of course they're concerned most with that um so the, it's a balancing act and i think yeah. it's because we're losing access we've yeah. we've lost a lot of places that have been traditional great places to hunt and so that puts more pressure on the places that remain um, so 
it's interesting. There's, I think what's going to happen and I don't know for sure, but it, it seems to me like what might happen is that a number of these states provinces are going to try different things and maybe they'll land on uh, some solutions that, you know, ease the pressure spread out that, that hunting pressure, but still allow um, the greatest opportunity and access. I hope that's what happens. And, and I think you nailed it, you know, uh, and you don't have to spill the beans too much on what your article is going to include, but um, access to me is the number one, when people talk about recruitment, you know, and yes, you have to do this and do that. But to me, access is your number one reason that we're having any sort of decline in participation in the outdoor world. Now, what, how do you, how do you solve that? And that's a tough thing because you can't really dictate how somebody treats their private land and, and what access they give. And I think that, I think the, honestly, I think bow hunters are partly to blame for this because oh. now I know. And I do the same <laughs> thing. Like I, I bow hunt and I have trail cameras out and I stay completely stay out of the land that I want to bow hunt until the season starts. And it's like, it's restricted even for deer hunters. And when you, back in the day when you'd ask, Oh yeah, go, you want to go try to walk through there, especially with your kid. Yeah. Well, go, go, go shoot a nice deer, whatever. That, those days are long gone. And when I lived in North Dakota, for waterfowl, I could generally get on, even if the land was posted, a lot of times I could generally get on it if I was waterfowl hunting, but they said, just don't touch my deer or pheasants. So that, that, that limiting of access is becoming such an important thing. And as a non-resident looking at North Dakota or even South Dakota, you know, those rules in North Dakota, the two weeks, what those, those have been in place for like 20 some years now, right? That was around the late nineties, mm -hmm. early two thousands that they, that they changed that, I think. And I, I know nobody really liked it at first, but you had basically two weeks. You can choose two weeks to go over there and hunt. And I think people are okay with that. Non-residents aren't, unless you live in Moorhead, you're not probably not going to travel to North Dakota more than that amount of time. But what I think is different about Kansas, Paul, is what was, it was on state land, right? And it was what, you, you could only hunt Mondays, Tuesdays, or Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. What what are they proposing about what days you can hunt public land down there? Yeah, so it's Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday that you would be able to hunt on state lands um, for, hmm. for waterfowl. That's what they've proposed. Now that, as uh, he told me, uh, that has to go through a lot of approval processes, public hearings, and other things. Um, so that may get modified, who knows. But but that's the that's yeah. the that's they're working with right now. So, do you think that's a better plan than having something like what North Dakota has, where you can just take two weeks? I mean, I, I it's it's tough for me because I travel a lot to hunt, so I hate seeing more restrictions put on me. But at the same time, when I hunt at home, I <laughs> hate seeing all the pressure that I get from people traveling. So I, I get the you know having it having a priority for the local residents and making sure that they have a good hunting experience. They're the ones living there, working there, paying their taxes there, um, you know, trying to do the, do the right things in a local area. And they don't, and especially they don't want to see some guy come in and lease up land that maybe they've been hunting forever and have him only come and hunt it, you know, one week out of the year or whatever it is, but have it locked up for the entire season. I, I understand the restrictions, but what, man, what, what is the right answer? Is it, do you think it's, it's probably not a one, one size fits all type answer. You know, yeah, I don't know. Sure. It's, it's, so one of the sorry. things, one of the things he said was, you know, if you hunt in Kansas from early teal season all the way to the close of goose season, that that's 144 hunting days. Wow. So that's a lot of hunting days. So if you knock out, you know, four sevenths of that, you're still, as a non-resident, going to have 60-some days where you can hunt anywhere you want in Kansas. And most people, I travel to hunt waterfowl to many states and provinces. I've been all over uh, the country and a lot of Canada as well. You know, you don't, some people go for a week, but a lot of times you'll go for, you know, three or four hunt days, right? So if you have three or four hunt days in a row, you know, you'd leave on a Saturday and get down there and, and hunt Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and maybe you hunt Wednesday on some private or, you know, on a, on federal land that's still open or, or find some other arrangement and then you go home. So I don't know if that's the, you know, time will tell if they implement. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And I guess, I guess those guys that are taking, taking those trips are taking days off of work anyway. So it doesn't matter if it's a Monday or Tuesday or a, or a Thursday or Friday, but, Mm -hmm. um, for the guys that live close to the border that like to hunt on the weekends and come down on the weekends a lot, I think you're going to, you're going to hear from them probably. Yeah. That's the folks that'll affect the most. They're the people who will make a day trip, you know, on a Saturday, they're not going to be able to do that if they're not a Kansas resident and go to a state, um, hunting property. You know, Brett, one of the things that you mentioned in reference to Manitoba changing their regulations, and I've got two things to say on that one, is one is um, I just I just completed my draw application just before coming on with you guys today. And for those listening, if you want to hunt Manitoba this year, you need to have that draw application finished, completed, and paid for by the 15th of July. If you don't do it by the 15th of July, you will not have an opportunity to hunt in Manitoba this year. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, I know that Manitoba was looking at North Dakota as well when they uh, put some of this into place. And one of the things that we haven't brought up yet is, you know, we used to hunt uh, the Devil's Lake area in Manitoba a lot when we were growing up. You know, we're talking uh, late 80s, uh, early 90s, and, and, you know, you could get out and you could hunt. In North Dakota? In North Dakota, right? In uh, that Devil's Lake area, and you could hunt to your heart's content, and you know, you had access like it was nobody's business. And I think the access issue that we're looking at, with uh, certainly in that area of North Dakota as well as others, and what Manitoba wants to avoid is that everything is getting leased up by yeah. guides and outfitters. Yeah. And so, so a lot of those places are getting hunted maybe once or twice a year, but you know, there's entire sections taken up. And, you know, the non-resident is not allowed to hunt in those areas. And so access is gone. Right. And that's happening. And that's happening in a lot of places. You know, some some of the biggest waterfowl staging areas that's happening all over. You can look at it all the way up and down the, the flyway. What do you, What is the answer there? Because, again, I mean, the guy starts a business. Mm-hmm. The guy pays the money. I'm not saying it's right. But what other than you know, limiting access to, to, to other hunters, what makes it wrong? Mm-hmm. You know, what's, what's the answer there? I don't know. That's a million dollar question. Part of what Manitoba did was cap the number of outfitters. So if right. you were a functioning outfitter pre COVID, you can still be a functioning outfitter going forward. But uh, you know, they've, they've capped the number of outfitters and those outfitters that were, operating say they had 50 hunters this is my understanding of it if they had 50 hunters in 2017 18 19 then that's their allocation going forward so they okay. can't all of a sudden lease up a whole bunch more ground and go from you know bringing in 50 hunters to bringing in 150 hunters or 200 hunters so that they're trying to control it that way and that's part of this manitoba uh, shift in regulations. And as far as I understand it, they cleaned up some of the outfitters that had allotments that weren't using them too and got rid of them so yes. that the people that were using them were, were hunters. You know, that that is one thing, the Canadian model that I that I haven't minded, you know, in Saskatchewan, you get your zones, I'm sure Manitoba is very similar, you get your zones that you can guide in and there can only be so many guides in that zone in only so many days or allotment that they can have there. And it does, I think, limit some of the guiding pressure, you know, here around Lac Parle, I think at one point we had i don't know four or five different guide services running around and it was like the early when we had the uh the early goose season i know the august season for sure we hunted it a couple of times and then all of a sudden all the stuff got got locked up and even in the september goose season it's like i i just we have very few wheat fields where we're at too so we're old fields like most there is only a handful of them and the guides lock them up right away and i mean we did we just don't even think about goose hunting very much during that early season locally anymore because everything gets locked up. So it's uh, I, I could see I could see that maybe being a, a, something we could steal from the Canadians as far as uh, limiting guide service. And I know every state down here is a little bit different on, on how they manage guides and some states are wide open. But, um, you know, maybe that's something we could do here. 
Yeah, we can open a whole can of worms right now with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll save that for another podcast. Um, and before we let you go here, guys, we got to talk about the uh, the Duck Hunters Expo. And, you know, Brad, it was funny. I, uh, we were talking before the show and we were talking about your past with uh, with Pheasants Forever and, and Pheasant Fest. And I was looking at the lineup here and the schedule for the Duck Hunters Expo. It's July 28th through the 30th, uh, State House Convention Center in Little Rock. And I was like, this looks a lot like, uh, this looks a lot like Pheasant Fest. Like there's a do- <laughs> the dog parade and. <laughs> Absolutely. I know. I just took, I took everything that worked really well for me when I was at Pheasants Forever and I just brought it over to the duck world. And then all the, all the failures that I had over in the pheasant world, I just <laughs> left those behind as well. So, uh, so what it, what. It really turned out to be here just in a very short amount of time is a very very successful well-run event um, it is the largest event dedicated to the duck hunter in north america hands down there's no question about it um, you will not find anything but duck hunting stuff in this expo floor whatsoever we've got three cool seminar stages we've got our duck dog stage we've got our duck hunter stage We've got our Delta waterfowl stage where you can see a lot of wild game cooking on this year. Um, it's it's just it just morphed into something really cool, and not just to the general public, but this was something that the the the, uh, the duck hunting industry, you know, the manufacturers of ammunition and waders and decoys uh, were craving, and they've uh, they've wrapped their arms around it and really embraced it, and uh, we'll be moving forward with this for a long time to come. So it was just kind of your your brain, you know, your creation then? Did you bring this to Delta Waterfall and say, hey, we should do this? I did, yes. Oh, nice. Absolutely. Okay. And how many? so how many years is it? It's only been a couple of years, right? Last year was our first year. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, and then was it the same place last year? Same place in uh, Little Rock at the State House Convention Center right downtown. Uh, we've got roughly 80,000 square feet in that area and i can tell you in 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 one year we've easily outgrown that space oh wow are you planning are you you gonna follow that pf model of moving it around a little bit or is it i am okay i am yes because it works really well um you know it's it's great to be able to tell your story in this case the delta waterfowl story uh and, and how we are the duck hunters organization to a different crowd in a different location as often as possible, at least once a year. And uh, it just, it, plus, you know, you, you know, you go to the sports show, um, you go to a sports show in any major city that's there year after year after year, and you're seeing the same folks, right. same time, same place year after year. And, uh, you know, if, if I miss it this year, well, I'll catch it next year. Well, in this situation, and, and just like it with Pheasant Fest, um, you know, if I miss it this year, I got to wait another five years before it ever comes back around. And, yeah. um, which, which, you know, gets people up out of their comfy chairs in the summertime. And no, that's a great, event. yeah, that's a great idea. And that, that's all honestly my biggest knock on Pheasant Fest. Cause it's like, oh dang it. It's not in Minneapolis this year. I gotta, I'm not, I mean, they're not going to be able to go or I got to travel to Kansas city or whatever mm-hmm. to go to it. But from, from yeah. your standpoint, it makes complete sense because it is, it does create some urgency when it does come to town. I know, um, well, this, I can't remember that last time I came through Minnesota or this year, I can't remember there. I wasn't going to go originally. And then I was like, God dang it. I, I gotta go. Like, it's not going to come back around for yeah. a few years. I got to go to it. So it makes total sense to move it around like that. And the exhibitors love it as well. They don't, they don't need to talk to the same people every right. year. Um, they like to switch it up and, uh, they like to go out to different restaurants for supper and what have you. And yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. All right. So what, what are a couple of the highlights? I know that for guys like us that uh, we're going to be in Saskatchewan actually at the time of this. So we're not going to be able to make it down there to Arkansas. Unfortunately, I would like to go to this, but um, there are going to be some ways that we can follow along. There's a podcast that's going to be going on during uh, yep. the expo. Yeah, we have our podcast um, that uh, uh, Joel Bryce, our chief of conservation uh, does down there. And so we'll be talking to a lot of the vendors as well as, um, you know, just some influential people within the waterfowl community. Um, that's kind of a cool deal. Um, two real neat highlights of the event are, are um, we do the World Championship Cut Down Calling Contest uh, is held at this event. And uh, that happened last year and was a huge hit. 
And then uh, this year we're also doing the uh, uh, call makers championship. So history and, and heritage is such a big part of waterfowling that we're going to honor waterfowl call makers of the past each year and do a tribute call contest. So every call maker will have to make a call similar to, in this case, uh, Mr. Taylor's, the Taylor duck call. Uh, and then they're judged based on that call and how it relates to the old calls of days gone by. And then we'll also have your regular calling contest where you can just kind of go off the wall and do whatever the heck you want. And, uh, and so there'll be two different classes and categories and we're really looking forward to that. You know, the funny thing is, is I love the guys at NWTF, but uh, we need to bring the uh, largest duck call making contest out of the turkey world and bring it into the duck world. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a great event. I was excited when I heard about it last year when you when you guys uh, announced it, and um, I'm glad it went well and that it's going to continue to go well. I'll look forward to it coming to Minnesota because I'm sure it will. And uh, maybe one of these years I'll have to travel down when it's when it's on the road too. And I know you guys are in Wisconsin. We, we're filming at Horicon. Uh, we're going to be doing a big film over there this fall. Maybe we'll uh, meet up and you guys can tell me a little bit more about the history of waterfowling in Wisconsin and, and Horicon Marsh. And anything else about Delta Waterfowl? I should say, if people want to want to join, there's a number of different levels. In fact, uh, I've been uh, I've had a membership. I, I think last year I think I had two two Delta Waterfowl memberships going at the same time actually which was kind of interesting. We got, got an extra magazine every time it came out. Uh, but now we're, we signed up as a, as a, I think the sponsor level, I think it is. So now fish, fish hunt forever is a, the sponsor level for Delta waterfowl, uh, which is great. We're, we're proud to support conservation organizations that are out there doing the work and not only, you know, not only work to, uh, increase access, increase habitat, you know, decrease predation, improve, improve the experience for hunters out there and introduce it to new people. Uh, but also the advocacy work that gets done too. um, you know, guys that are out there dealing in the, the sludge of the, the politics of it all, you know, that is the kind of stuff that guys like us hate to do, but we need people to do it. So when we have an organization that, that will wade into the waters of, of you know, the shark infested waters of, of Washington, D.C. and the, the the state capitals. It's nice. We appreciate it, I guess, is where I'm going with this. So I'm happy to support organizations that are doing it. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, tell people where we can learn more about all these things. Yeah, so Absolutely. go to our website, deltawaterfall.org. And there's <clears throat> there's all four of our pillars are on there. Duck production, habitat conservation, Hunter 3, which is recruitment, retention, reactivation. And of course, research and education uh, are on there. You can read about our policy work that you just referenced as well. There's, there's, uh, that's why we call ourselves the Duck Hunters Organization because we uniquely work on all four of those pillars. And if you want to make it really easy, just come on down to the Duck Hunters Expo in Little Rock, July 28th, 29th, and 30th. And with your $10 entry fee into the event, children under 16 are free. Bring the whole family. Uh, you will also get a six-month free digital membership to the organization. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, Paul Waite, Brad Heidel, uh, keep up the good work, and let's do this again. Thanks for the time today on the show. Right on. Thank you. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.